Okay, welcome to podcast number 36, and I got a new guest here. We got Ty Wilson here. What's up, Ty? Hey, you know, chilling, man. Chilling. Just hanging. Just hanging. hanging out, yeah. Well, thanks for coming, and thanks for being here, and thanks for staying at my place and yeah. meeting you. And uh, Thanks for putting me out. You know? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> it worked out super well for me while I'm here. Yeah, exactly. Um, why don't you tell, tell just a little bit about yourself, and then uh, let... The viewers know what you're here for. Like you're doing a, a seminar, or a, a course, right? Yeah, a program. Yeah, yeah, program. Yeah. So um, I'm a alt country or just country artist from Peterborough, Ontario. Um, I've been putting out music now. I mean, my whole life. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I think I put out my first song when I was 15 years old. So I'm 34 now. So almost 20 years of, of putting out music. Um, I started out in the screamo and metal realm and then i kind of gradually got softer as the, as the years went on uh started doing more singer songwriter stuff in my early 20s and then uh crossed into country um a few years back and so i took a bit of a hiatus in the middle but uh started putting out music again back in 2022 just after the pandemic so it's uh yeah man it's been a cool journey i'm doing a cmi so it's canadian music incubator Yep. is what it's called and uh basically what it is it's kind of like an intensive artist entrepreneur program mm -hmm. to uh yeah help artists like myself kind of just understand the business a little better and um get set up moving forward it's great for networking um you know we run it out of the cmi and uh coalition music management offices so it's pretty cool where's that is that that's in in kensington that office is it Augusta? Is it yeah, Augusta? Kensington, Chinatown. Um, basically, we're Dundas and Spadina. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've been doing tunes for a long time, man. 20 years. That's, uh, that's I've been doing since 99, so that's, uh, yeah, that's a little bit. Too. You got a couple of years on me, yeah, so. <laughs> well, I am a lot older than you, too, yeah. so. I'm 11 years older than you, so. <clears throat> right. Yeah, 45. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, country, when did you really decide like this is like something you want to really because it, it's like to me, it seems like like a lot of Canadian artists are super multi talented. They can do a lot mm -hmm. of stuff. They can do like all sorts of styles. Yeah. But obviously, you got to pick one to really hone in on and like kind of like uh, carve your groove, I guess. So when did you when did you really say oh I love country and this is like something I'm really gonna like shift towards and kind of gravitate towards? So I I grew up my my grandmother was actually a, a country singer a local country singer, um, and she had her own TV show in the late fifties early sixties in no Peterborough way. called Court the Junction. Um, my whole so her mother my great grandmother has a star on the Peterborough Walk of Fame for fiddling. Um, and so the countryside was always there. I just kind of grew up in a really fun household where um, mom's side was all country and then my dad's side was all rock and roll. Oh, so, so you like were immersed in I it. I was immersed just... in it. You know, if I'm riding the car with mom, it's going to be country. If I'm yeah. riding the car with dad, it's going to be rock. Uh -huh. So, and it got to a point where my dad was like feeling um, uneasy about all the country that I was listening to. So he would. <laughs> put me in the car and we'd listen to the local radio station, The Wolf, and he would make me like rhyme off, okay, you know, Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. When the Levy Break, like the names and and years and stuff of, of all the songs that were coming on the radio just to make sure yeah. I, I was listening <laughs> to rock music. Well, country's some heavy subjects, man. Yeah. It's like, it's... Uh... Not not a whole hundred, not a lot of it is very like, you know, there's uplifting songs, but a lot of it is like uh, heartache and tough times. And I mean, especially in the 90s, right? Yeah, because exactly. When I was growing up, it, yeah. was, uh, it was an interesting time for country music. And that was like really like the renaissance of the Garth Brooks's and Alan Jackson's and stuff like that. So like, I think one of my earliest memories is singing Chattahoochee in the, like my grandmother had a... Uh, little karaoke machine in the basement actually when i say little not little at all it's huge because uh, it was the <laughs> early 90s a karaoke machine and so like one of my earliest memories is that's the stack one that's oh yeah, the, yeah. No, it was like 
full on like two speakers and a full fucking stereo system. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But uh, so I come by music honestly. I guess that's the the runaround round way of saying that of like it. Uh, I was pretty much fully immersed in it from a very young age, and and uh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a musician and and be on stage. So it was it was cool to be able to to follow that and and uh, and do my thing and start playing. Yeah, totally. It's uh, it's it's cool to find your own when you find like you find what you're really digging in your own style. Um, you write all your stuff, obviously. Ninety percent of it, yeah, yeah. 90%. So, so you have some <clears throat> so a little bit of collaboration, kind of. Well, I yeah, so I do I do a lot of co-writing. Um, mm. That's just kind of the country sphere. Is there's a lot of co-writing, um, and then for this next record that I'm putting out. Uh, I took three outside songs, uh, which is not something I generally do, but um, I really like the songs, <laughs> so so I went with it, and I could see myself playing them. So that that was uh, how I moved forward with that. And um, Out, sorry, outside, you mean like somebody else wrote it? Yeah, or? somebody else wrote it. Gotcha. So they they gotcha. wrote it and pitched it to me, and yeah, yeah. and uh, these are all Nashville guys, and so I really liked the songs and um, and wanted to put them out. So. That's what we did, but I generally kind of stick to a rule of like seventy five percent of what I record is has to be my own, or else or else I feel weird. Well, yeah, yeah. it's, it's um, well, it's 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 more genuine, I in my opinion, but it's uh, I do understand the the basis of it, and uh, you know when you're a, a big artist and it's a machine, and it's you got to produce a lot of stuff. I understand yeah. like having co-writers and stuff like that it's uh um i always i, I want to do like a census like a mm -hmm. pepsi challenge yeah. thing and i want to lay country lyrics and rap lyrics <laughs> and to see if people can distinguish which is which you know I mean, yeah it's, it just like if you generalize it more, right. you know, in a way, because it's... Uh, One's going to have a whole lot of trucks and riverbanks and fishing and women uh, and beer. And the other one's going to have a whole lot of, like, Porsches and Lamborghinis and, and women, women and, and beer and alcohol. And alcohol. <laughs> and and al <laughs> yeah. so it's just another same yeah. head of the different... That's why I, wanted, I thought yeah. it'd be an interesting census to be like... What, what do you think of this one? Yeah. Like, grabbed a shotgun, killed his wife. It's like... That rap? No, that's a country no, song. Country song yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of similarities in in those cases. Well, there's storytellings. Like, the story I, I'm yeah. very compelled with with country music because the stories. Well, that's kind of why I I moved towards that, especially now, um, because you can really. It's one of the last bastions of music where you can actually write a story yeah. and and have. Um, yeah, actual instruments and stuff like that. I find, mm -hmm. you know, in the pop realm, that's really not that existent anymore. That yeah. production wise, that's not a big um, focus. So, um, being able to to play country and still get on stage with a band and and perform is is kind of like, yeah, that, that felt like home. It felt like the right place to be. So, speaking of bands, you just you had an awesome gig. Uh, recently, a big stage at the X at the CME. Yeah. How did that come about? I, I've, uh, I've shot at the CNE as a cameraman. I've been yeah. there as a kid. I, I've, I've never performed. I imagine that was fucking awesome. That yeah, was it like, was. It was super cool. Um, it was definitely a, a bucket list item to check off. Um, for us, I mean, we, I got emailed about it. Um, and I don't really know. They just asked me to do it, so so I was really? like, I was like, like oh, fuck yeah. yeah, I don't I don't remember ever applying for that, so well, that was really cool that that uh, you know I was just kind of asked to do it, and um, uh, yeah, we played over there on the country stage, and it was great. They have you know all the staff were amazing, the the stage was awesome, you know, very very good setup, and uh, it was an honor to be able to play it, you know, somewhere where. As a child, you're you know you go there and that's a that's a big deal. So yeah, yeah. Imagine you went there as a kid. 
I think once or twice. Well, you're well, from I mean, Peterborough. From so Peterborough, it's a bit so of a yeah, track. yeah, yeah. That's we went a bit to of like track. there was a Peterborough exhibition, which was yeah. you know the the, the little tyke version. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like the the it's a step up. It. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, I I just started playing in Peterborough a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, it's funny because my dad has a connection there. He's done business there for like forty years. So there's always a, there's been a connection there, and I always had like a good sense of uh, wow, there's unique creativity here in this part of town. It's a a very uh, I'll say uh, great at uh, storytelling, whatever your genre is. Yeah, it's it's an eccentric community. <laughs> That's very musical. That's the word I was yeah. looking for. I was gonna say theatrical, but I was more eccentric. Is, is yeah. right up the right. You're right there. Uh, yeah, but no, there's a ton of artists that came, that came, you know, come out of the Peterborough area. So it's uh, um, it's definitely well known for 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 music. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I was, you know, everybody I met there was was part of the community, and it was tight. And it's like very outside the box kind of thinking too. I did a kitchen party there that was interesting. That was fun. And uh, yeah, a couple of other different unique type of uh, events I did. Uh, I did a, a radio piece at uh, Trent. That was fun. Oh, that's that was one cool. of the only in-person ones I've done Sweet. for a while. Um, yeah, that was cool. Yeah, I mean, Peterborough is Peterborough has such a rich, I mean, history, music, and and sadly, you know, COVID and the pandemic, as it did with a lot of places. Um, you know, a lot of the venues closed and stuff yeah. like that. Um, but prior to that, I mean, that was my whole high school career and my, like the metal bands and screamo bands I was in, that was like what you did. You went to, you went downtown and watched shows on, yeah. on the weekends and stuff like that. And, and, um, you know, we're, I guess we're trying to kind of build it back up again now and, and hope that the coming years can lead to some more venues opening back up and, and yeah. that stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, as, as, as of as everywhere COVID did a, a number on, on a lot of the live music venues and it's uh, it sucks to see yeah ones that were like kind of teetering already yeah it just crushed them that was it and uh yeah well I seem to think there's a new wave of like different styles of whatever venues you know mm -hmm. uh ways of viewing music and so many different things like I did the this festival on the beaches here and it's like it's not you don't have to uh play at a club or a bar anymore it's like there's so many different choices now you can bring your you know expertise somewhere or your your package basically like yeah. you're a, a you know a product you're yeah. selling yourself as a a night out of as entertainment you know as yeah. if somebody was going to a movie or like a play or something like that you're providing the whole thing for sure i mean there's a lot of those organizations and that stuff I think side door. Uh, I, I work with a company called Backyard Music Co. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of that kind of popping up in the transition where, yeah, you can go and, and play those house gigs and, and backyard gigs. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, uh, it's still, I mean, it's still a gig. <laughs> so yeah, a gig's a gig. A gig's a gig. Yeah, so, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, like, um, were you, uh, like touring a lot leading up to the lockdown and like gave you a break or was it just like you had a whole bunch of shit planned and like lock it like threw it away like what happened with that period so i uh, the lockdown for me went in phases yeah, of, all, of all. bad yeah. to good um and it ended up being a really good thing for me uh because prior to lockdown i was really just playing bar gig like cover bar gigs mm -hmm. i hadn't written songs in a long time and uh oh okay yeah and so and i was kind of like complacent with my life <laughs> and then the lockdown happened and then i i got laid off from my job so it forced you to forced me to to kind of transition and uh i also like went through super bad depression and alcoholism and um then sought help and got medicated and, uh, oh, and started amazing. my first round of, of sobriety and, and stuff you. like that. And, and so it ended up, 
and then I lost a hundred pounds and it started like being this really positive thing. And as I was going through that transition, uh, I started writing music again. And, uh, and then by like early 2022, um, Sean Moore, who I did my, uh, my first or this, the EP that got my first country EP, let's say that, cause it wasn't my first recording. Um, uh, my first country EP, he kind of was like, Hey man, like I, I really want to, I think you should write songs. I think you're, you know, you're talented and, and we can move forward with this. So that's kind of how that all rolled out. I wrote songs with him and then we ended up recording a bunch of them and I started releasing back in April, 2022 and kind of like, it's just been a steady incline since. So, um, the, yeah, the, the lockdown started out very bad for me, but ended up being probably one of the best things for me um, in terms of like putting music back in the frontier of my life and and kind of shaking up my comfort zone and what I was doing. Well, congratulations to you on like like a huge improvement and like you know uh, stepping out of all those realms. Yeah, yeah. So congratulations on that front and like yeah, like that's really interesting everybody went through a different perspective yeah and it's very uh positive and uplifting to hear like that you like it did something positive for you like you said it got you out of your comfort zone that's that's mm -hmm. a key thing you said there that's uh yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh I imagine you like you had to bust your ass. It wasn't just oh, yeah. it's not just handed to <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, like, man, it just I, didn't I, just I, didn't happen to you. So I imagine you just yeah. like you got to a point where you're just like I got to do this, and it's just like one day at a time. Yeah, man. And, I mean, uh, it's like uh, I had a, a string of like blackout nights and stuff like that, and um, and it kind of called me. My thirtieth birthday was really bad. My parents came to like check on me at midnight because I thought I might like shoot myself or kill myself and it, it was never in my mind it was never that bad but if that's how people were perceiving it um then coming up is... then, then something's like something's not right um and yeah i was miserable i was almost 320 pounds and um i was I, i'm a, a guy that was an athlete most of my life mm -hmm. um so that was very off brand and then i was just like i was just drinking way too much yeah yeah and that's something that runs in my family and I had to check myself on. And, um, and so I decided like start of 2021, that was, I was, I was going to quit drinking for a year. That was kind of how it started. So I was going to quit drinking for a year and that'll, you know, help me out. So that was when, so I did, I, I quit drinking for that year. I lost at that point about 80 pounds. Mm. Um, was medicated, got on medication, and um, my life turned around completely 360. And, uh, or I guess 180, 360, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get, you get what I mean. All the way around. All the way around. All the way around. Um, and so uh, that was my first time going sober. I started drinking again, but um, life was, you know, life was great after that. And uh, the decision I made not to drink again, I'm now... I'll be almost 17 months. So you're almost a year and a half. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, just came out of like seeing that pattern of self-sabotage and like very slippery slope of going back to drinking the same way I was. And so I just went, now I, this is just something that I, I can't have in my life and and uh, move forward without it. Good for you, man. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome to hear. And uh, like like you said you it's really helped you with make decisions with your music and it's like mm -hmm. interesting that kind of coincides with that you said you kind of stepped out of a different realm like you were doing just covers of yeah. market so you're just yeah. like took a hold of your music too yeah i mean the big a big thing is like is that an outlet too that helped that must have helped balance like that must have been a nice like balance to make some new stuff and be like For oh wow i'm like it brought me out of a, a complacency. I didn't have a whole lot of confidence at yeah. that point. And I was kind of, I had just settled into like, this is how I'm going to make a career now was just being a bar musician. And there's nothing, by all means, nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with that, that if that's your thing. Nope. But it wasn't fulfilling for me. Yeah. And so it allowed me to like start, yeah, I guess filling my cup back up, 
being able to or writing and, and actually putting out my own music again and being able to do that too. So Good for you. Yeah. So you said um, you made rock music. So when did you start doing that? Like, what? what how long was that period? Like, uh, fourteen. Thir- that? Yeah, yeah, thirteen, fourteen. So you guys, did you do metal like right away? Yeah, like yeah, I, was, I was. I mean, I was sorry. I guess it was like. How a, didn't you? It was a slow burn from punk. So yeah, yeah, like yeah, I remember yeah. listening to bands like. Oh, yeah. one or the other, metal yeah, or punk. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah, like yeah. starting out with like Andy Flag and Bad Religion yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. I went to Warp Tour to see those. Amazing. Guys and yeah. Like, yeah. Somersault and. Fuck yeah. Yeah. And that was what, you know, I kind of started falling in love with that stuff. Yeah. And then I moved into the, I guess they would call it the emo and screamo realm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, local, I mean, Toronto, Oakville, Silverstein, they were yeah. a huge one for me, and Hawthorne Heights, and As yeah. I Lay Dying. I've and heard like, those guys. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it ranges in a spectrum from, like, pop emo or pop punk all the way to, like, death metal. And I kind yeah. of loved all of it in between. So um, we, started, we started our band... It would have been I would have been fifteen, um, and we had a we ended up signing a record deal with Voodoo Records out of Toronto or Scarborough when I was seventeen, uh, and then the band broke up before we ever did a record. So no way. <laughs> so did you guys even do a show? Oh, we were doing. Well, we had played a shit ton of shows. Oh, so you're like, we were already. Shows. I was like, we were touring with my dad's minivan oh, and a tiny gotcha. green like backup tra- or like trailer that my Amazing. parents had. My parents are amazing, by the way. My parents had bought us for for music. And so, um, yeah, we were playing at, like, the Rock Pile and, like, oh, uh, yeah, the yeah. Cathedral yeah. downtown here and the Dungeon in Oshawa. Like, yeah. we were playing all the, the grimy, you know, yeah. rock venues. Um, and so that was where that all started. And uh, when the band disbanded, it, I, it, like, broke me because I... Um, I I was very invested. Yeah. And um, so then going off to university is kind of when I started playing like hard rock and I joined another band. What did you play there? Sorry, guitar or the lead singer? I was lead singer yeah, so um, and, and did guitar? not play much guitar. Okay. No. No, I just ran around the stage doing front kicks and gotcha. screaming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that, was, that was my fun for, for, the, for then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Just wanted to know. Good. Yeah. Uh, visual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, there's there's pictures on, on oh, Facebook and stuff awesome. like that. Yeah. I had like the blonde swoop and everything. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, how long did that go for? That was. Yeah. So, that was, I guess, almost three years just because of high school. So, we started okay. when I was in grade 10. So, yeah, pretty much three years. Um, we played there. And then, uh, and then, like I said, yeah, we broke up and I went up. I went off university in Quebec, so I went to Bishop's University for a couple of years in Sherbrooke. Really didn't play a whole lot of music oh, there, you know, sure. the audio, the old, yeah. the audio co- uh, open mic. And then I moved to Guelph because I was actually acting. Um, I had an agent oh, yeah. and I was working in Toronto as an actor because I thought, because I was a theater minor, like I was in school for yeah. theater as well. And so I started doing that and um, they were like, oh, you play music too? And yeah, okay, well, want to do all this music stuff as well inside so i was going out for musicals and, and things like that and uh i really just the acting world i didn't like it i didn't like going yeah, to cattle yeah. calls i didn't like you know it was just something where i was like ah you know what this is i don't know if this is for me so i really started focusing back on music again and, and then that's when i joined a, a hard rock band actually out of toronto called riots and revelry Oh, that's awesome. And uh, we had, it was more like in the stained, yeah. you know, theory of a dead man kind of realm mm-hmm. of alternative rock. And uh, we put out a record or an EP and um, did some touring with them. And and it was, it was awesome. I still love those songs and stuff like yeah. that. And so that was kind of like the rock record. And then from there, I, uh, uh, that band broke up. And I signed another record deal with Vic Park Records. So they had a, a big um, pop band called Neverist um, here that had a couple of old records and stuff like that. And uh, so working with them, I worked out of a studio in Liberty Village for a couple of years. Oh, yeah. And uh, commuted back and forth. It was on at Atlantic. BMG there on BMG the corner. BMG there. It was, this yeah. one was on Atlantic Ave. So yeah. um, That was the mecca in that <laughs> yeah, corner. That all area. the record labels were all there. Yeah. 
I used to work at Chorus. Oh, the nice. Old, okay. Original the old Chorus. original real yeah. 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 So did that and then I put out kind of like a pop rock record and um, it didn't do anything. And so the label ended up disbanding and I uh, fucked off to BC. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before I came. So I was there for a couple of years. Again, kind of went through that phase of like not yeah, yeah. doing anything. I was playing open mics and stuff like that. Kind of like, oh, I busk every once in a while to make some extra money because I was yeah. fucking broke. And uh, if you go stand in front of a bar in Victoria at 3 a.m., like you'll make money. You'll from do all right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so then I moved back to Ontario and that's when I really started doing the, uh, the cover gigs and leading up until now. So it's been a... So it's a long journey of music yeah but, man yeah. that's quite an array that's like uh, uh, yeah everybody has their journey it's interesting how you've like uh, navigated all these different styles of, of music yeah and, like different uh, energies well they all yeah for each of like it provides like so much different like obviously a front for a rock singer yeah it's a lot more animation and then another you know a different yeah. style of you know, it's all different. Yeah, it's different uh, energies and different like uh, way your mind thinks when you perform too. For sure, um, and that's yeah. I have it's. I feel like I have like seven personalities. <laughs> well, you'd have sometimes. to, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, to be creative, yeah. you kind of have to, really. It's good that I have it's a like, bit of an acting background. Yeah, there I can, you like, go. Put there. myself in <laughs> yeah. those places. Yeah. yeah. I uh, I had a. I started kind of like with uh, extra roles and stuff like that. I started because mm -hmm. I couldn't get anything out of school because I came out for television and I looked and looked and looked. My mom's friend was a cast, or no, she was a set designer. So she's like, oh, I know this casting director. So I had a just meeting with her and then I was getting calls for extra work and then it got really busy and then SARS hit and just killed and just the it. whole film in like 2003. All, like, yeah, just killed And I was doing television. some cool shit actually. I was yeah. getting some cool shit and then she got signed by Universal so I had to do like some audition for her and I was like, ah, oh, this is not my thing. Because I would go to all these like auditions and I'm right. like, I don't want to, this is kind of yeah. weird. Well, and that's... Some of them, and some of them for like print, for like here, throw this uh, you know oily, greasy uh, wife beater shirt on. And yeah. Like, eh, uh, but why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ask too many questions. That's why they're like, don't ask questions. Just fucking yeah. do it. It's a dark room. Yeah. We, we need a yes person, <laughs> yeah, not, exactly. not a wait. Hold on a second, person. <laughs> but I came in in the age it was like the early two thousands and. Uh, there was a lot of, well, there's scams now, but there was a yeah. lot of scams there where you go into somebody's, uh, you find an ad. They were all in like the back of the Now magazine. Oh, right. <laughs> so you'd have, you'd find an ad for like uh, extras wanted. It right. says extras for like, you know, some movie that's all B, they're all like B movies, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you call up this agent and then you go there and they have movie posters on the wall and they're like, it's just some uh, dude. You want, no, yeah, but they're like, yeah, we'll get you in this movie today, but we need like the $60 up front oh. for a fee. And I'm like, no, no, no. You hire somebody, like you get the job, and then I give you a percentage. Like, yeah. That's how it works. How so I'm like, have a nice day. Yeah. See you later. And I go into the into the hallway, and I was like, don't do this, do folks. Yeah. This is a dumb, this guy's trying to scam you. Fuck. And it's like, man, uh, yeah, there was nothing like that was checked. No, I mean, even now, well, not no, nothing like that was checked at all then. So no. Yeah, you could just end up in some dude's fucking basement. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, this isn't going no. to any movie or I had some fucking cool, casting agent. I had a couple of cool experiences. I got to be in um, Sum 41's first music video. Sick. I was an extra in that one, and DMX was in it. So. Oh, well, that's cool. I was in a video with DMX. Yeah, I was in, I ended up doing a music video for Karen, Karen Ellis, uh, Bitter Grass is filmed at the beach. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the films. I did a, a couple commercials. No way. Um, and then I was, cat with the, I think my like straw from, you know, Camel's Back moment was I was cast in, in a movie, like a B movie as one of the leads um, yeah. as like the school bully. And 
I waited. They waited on clearances for that. So I ended up like having the part and being excited for like six months. And then the movie just folded and nothing and nothing got made like that they, happens so they, much. they shelved it yeah and i was fucking heartbroken and i'm like fuck this i'm yeah i uh that's the unspoken <laughs> part about acting and like all those shit it's like how many missed yeah equals one getting exactly a role or a job or like yeah. yeah she this agent of mine she she went into another level so she got some like crazy auditions she got me like uh an xbox audition one time yeah and she's like all you have to do is say like two words in italian you're italian right I'm like no i'm not i don't speak any italian and i was just lucky that my italian relatives were like in town yeah. so i was like you know what i can memorize the lines that they want right yeah so she's like yeah yeah because they'll gas you up because they, they get a good percentage well right? yeah yeah they're, like, they're, yeah you can do it yeah of yeah, course you can you're they're italian like, you can fucking do it they're totally <laughs> blinding you into this yeah. fucking you know self-confidence right and then uh i'm like yeah i memorized the line so i get to the audition and they're like yeah say the line so i said the line in italian it's like probably broken italian and they're like okay great can you say another line and a couple things are in italian and i was like fuck yeah. <laughs> I was like, Hold on, shit yeah fuck and they're like you don't really speak it do you i was like not really no. But I'm Italian. So. I didn't even think how, like, that was kind of stupid thinking because, like, how far did I think I was going to get? Like, if I got on set and they're like, all right, can we need a few scenarios from you? And they're like, fire this fucking yeah. idiot right away. Wait a second. I so, thought you were supposed to tell me what I'm supposed to say. Yeah, it's uh, better that I, uh, I didn't get it. It's, uh, yeah. So there were some interesting ones. and uh, But then it died and then I got, um, I got work in television. And then I stuck with it for like 25 years. So that pays the bills and the music is just like, uh, you know, helps me out. Right. Keeps me sane. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. You said you did some reality TV shows and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. I did a lot. I did uh, Big Brother. I did uh, Battle of the Blades. I did uh, Canadian Idol. I yeah. did uh, So You Think You Dance. I did. Do they have a can Canadian one? Or yeah. No? Oh, wow. There is a lot of Canadian things of like uh, just cookie cutter. Oh, bigger, yeah. American Big one. Brother, Canada. Yeah. The Amazing Race, like, Canada. Canada. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, there were a couple of odd ones I did, like one offs, mm -hmm. like match game and game shows. And like I got offered a lot of that's when I knew that part of the industry was going really south was reality TV. And yeah. that's like cheap in the whole industry, basically. Right. And uh, man, and it happened so fast because Toronto is a cheap place to shoot. Yeah. So that's what SARS was about too. Like mm -hmm. Toronto, up all the '90s, it was a really cheap place to shoot in the early 2000s, and then all of a sudden it just like fell off. Yeah. And then it picked up a few years ago. And so reality TV was kind of like a, a, the new home base in Toronto was like a lot right. of the reality TV shows went because it was cheap to get labor and everything. So I got a few offers. It was hilarious. Like uh, The Bachelor, they mm -hmm. called me. And it was like $185 a day. Now, like for most people, $185 a day is a good day. Right. But in like that term of that position is like usually 350 400 and I, I work with this uh, French Canadian guy he's like old school steady cam guy yeah. and then a lot of the French TV guys they don't fuck around <laughs> he's like what did they offer you he's like that's my rate in 1985 and he's like <laughs> tell them to go fuck themselves <laughs> I mean yeah it's but it's a lot of those shows, it's like volume. You work a lot. Right. You end up working for like three months. So it's gotcha. alluring like that. And yeah. so a lot of things like that repeat, you know, so you have a, a following year and a following year. So it's a good, you know, it's a good bankroll. Right. Uh, but it's, it's another beast in itself. Like live television sports is something else. And live television entertainment is like another yeah. issue. You know, uh, I like, sh I, sh I used to be involved with a lot of music, mm -hmm. 
entertainment stuff. So there's I did a lot of like reality TV and music stuff, but I always love the live music stuff just because I play music and I'm involved in it and all that stuff. And it's like I love every aspect of it now to like the whole components of like putting on an entire show from the sound to the video to the acts to like coordinating uh, gear and everything right like it's really exciting and I'm very lucky that I've been surrounded with so much of it for like 25 years 20 plus years of just like you know whether it's like being a house site operator watching some big shows or like being involved in it shooting in it like being set up so it's like I think it's all um, yeah it's been a great experience so I kind of <coughs> left the reality the TV part mm -hmm. away like 10 years ago because uh, I was making good money but I was doing like a lot of hours a lot of work and, right. and like my health was not great yeah. it was like I went to the doctor and she's like your blood pressure's through the roof and you're like 35 <laughs> and I was like oh fuck shit maybe I should slow this roll <laughs> so I just decided to do sports and uh, I was like, I really, really, really want to put 100%, 100 into this music. I think right. I can do it. I know I can do it. So that's when I really buckled down and I started like playing out of town mm -hmm. and then like really taking it seriously as like a nine to five thing. I'm like, right. okay, I got these things to do. I can task these out and complete it. And it's just like, take this as a serious job, you know? Yeah. And, uh, Things started shifting then, like it really happened, mm -hmm. and uh, it was cool because it's like, then you could uh, understand like all the facets of being an independent artist. Yeah, I mean, it goes along with the program that I'm in. The entrepreneurial stuff that you don't <laughs> you don't think about it when you think of. Artists. Look at how we fucking circled that, buddy. That was nice, man. See that? See that? <laughs> that was fucking sweet. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's all business that yeah. But people on the other side are like, oh, you just come here and you play music. And it's like, no, I don't know. No, I got a no. fucking invoice. I got to keep all my you know all my records of everything. QuickBooks is my best friend. Yeah. <laughs> and everything. also, like you know, I'm my own manager. I'm my own booking agent. I'm my own you know radio person um ninety percent of the PR, you know, shout out to AM to FM though, because they camera do operator. my my radio stuff now, thankfully. But yeah, camera operator, social media fucking expert. Editor, yeah. At everything. You you own you have every job. Yeah. So um you have to know how to run your business or at least look at it like I'm gonna put aside these hours per week to work on this business yeah. and the things I need to do. Um I unfortunately I wish I could just I'm sure you two too. Like, just get up on, show up somewhere, get up, get up on stage, and um, and perform. And that was that's my job. Yeah, but it's unfortunately not it. Showed up here with yeah. the white gloves. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah, that's only you know later on in the career when you're signed to a label and you get to yeah. just have people do all the things for you and you just show up and play. I see why the big stars do that, man. It's like focus on the. The show. As soon as I make enough money to start hiring shit out, like I'll be doing that. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Just make sure there's no red M and M's. God damn it. <laughs> My rider. Only the green. <laughs> only, 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 only the green. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> what would your rider be like? What would you do? Like if you had, like if they gave you, like, hey, you got a budget. Here's your shit. What would you ask oh, for? Oh man. Well, because. Uh, I don't drink alcohol anymore. It's going to be super fucking boring. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Uncrustables. Smarker's Uncrustables. Mm -hmm. Shout out. Um, t throat coat tea. Yeah. That's a big one. Water, Coke Zero. Uh, I mean, chips. I'm a big chip fan, so like... So not a huge... No, you know, I'm not, I'm not yeah. like a super... Uh, you know, I'm not. Don't need to go get gypsy tears. No, I'm not. I'm not, a bougie, I'm not a bougie guy, man. As long as yeah. I get, I get fed and I, I have lots of tea, yeah. then, then I'm pretty fucking easy. I think I'd yeah. be pretty easy too. Yeah. I'd just be like, yep, yeah, some sparkling water and uh, lemon. Yeah. 
Thing over yeah. Here. I was pretty sad. I went to this one in New Hampshire. I was pretty happy. I was like, they got a kettle. Holy jeez. <laughs> I was like, this is fucking sweet. Oh, man. I mean, There's a place to sit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's where I'm a little bit spoiled. So I'm also in a, in a, in a, um, a tribute band called Against the Wind. So uh, we're, yeah. uh, we're a 10 piece Bob Seeger tribute. Oh, sick. Um, and uh, I'm super lucky. They're all Toronto, like, you know, session guys or, 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 or previous touring musicians with big acts and stuff like that. And uh, I got, I get to sit and learn from these dudes as a, you know, I, I, when I joined, I was 30 years old. So like I had to really earn my stripes and, and, yeah. and be accepted. But once I got there, you know, they've all become very close family and uh, we get to play theaters all over the country in the U S and stuff like that. So Sick. I've been blessed to have, you know, those nice green rooms with snacks on the table and, and, uh, and kettles yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, well, and then I, mean, I go back to playing my own gigs and it's like, yeah, you're like, here's a closet and maybe, yeah, a, I have to pay maybe for some water. water. What do you mean? I have to pay for exactly, the soda yeah. water? Yeah. I don't get a meal. What are you yeah. talking about? <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, once you taste it, you're like, ah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's one of my favorite stories to tell is, uh, just on like to somebody new or getting into music as a juxtaposition of what it is yeah is like um a couple of years ago we went down to uh greensboro pennsylvania so just outside of pittsburgh and played a show and it was like 700 plus people yeah. for the gig and the next night i came back to ontario and it was a, a shitty night in cottage country and i played to two people on a on a patio so, so way she goes but it's that's like the, that's how they say it in canada yeah way she goes, fucking way but. she goes but like that's and that's that's the truth about, about it you're true, that's so fucking true yeah yeah i yeah. played in well i played in fucking montreal i played in montreal like in two known places like a person each night i had two shows like there's maybe two person two people the one night two people the next night a Monday night, the last show I did in New Hampshire on a Monday night, there was like 45 people there. Yeah. It was like, just no advertising. No, they're just, just there. They're just like, here, where are we here? Oh, yeah, because we always come check music out. Yeah. It's like a huge difference. Just like people are always going out to see music. And I shout out to the Americans because oh, fuck yeah. Americans fucking love live music. Yes. I've been privileged enough to go down to, to Texas and some of the southern states and they are you know like they'll ride or die with you if you like your, if they like your music so um yeah shout out to my our u.s friends for sure because because yeah guys, you guys will actually go listen to music <laughs> oh yeah no fucking tip nice and, yeah yeah I've, I've only had a couple of gigs but i like mm -hmm. it already uh any uh gigs leading up coming in the future coming up uh i just finished kind of the big ones um and then i'm heading down to the states again at the end of this month uh, I think I'm playing a couple shows around Texas, and then I'm um, I got nominated for uh, Texas International Country Music Award oh, this year. Shit. So I'm going down there to perform and uh, hopefully win. And then uh, when I come back, it's pretty quiet. I think this is all by design. I wanted it to be quiet, kind yeah, of quiet yeah. time. So uh, it'll be kind of be this album release or this the, the first single from that album be dropping around mid October. And uh, and then I have a, a few of the the tribute shows in November. Um, I think Brantford, Chatham, and Windsor. Okay. And uh, and then you know pretty much slowed right down for December and and move into the new year. And then I'm I'm planning a tour in the states for kind of March April of next year. So sweet. Yeah, it'll uh, trying to hit it. You know, two barrels next next spring going into next yeah. summer. That's great. Build it up. So you. You said you've had material you is finished and you're ready to release it in yeah, October. I got eight songs. Oh, I got eight songs completed. I, I recorded a record down in Houston uh, at Edgewater Music, um, in Sh so yeah, Sugarland, Houston area. Um, so I've got distribution through the Orchard with that and um, eight songs ready. Uh, I'll be pressing that into CDs and vinyl. Uh, and just selling those at shows only, and I'll release the other stuff as singles kind of over the next year and a half, um, and have a few of those go to radio. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, people, you know, albums don't do as well anymore, so you gotta do that it's single life. Sell, it's a hard sell, yeah. yeah. So, the, so putting out singles and just seeing kind of what 
sticks. I mean, it goes back to like, yeah, the whole social media game and everything. Like, put out a single, make a billion fucking little snippet videos and put them on TikTok and Instagram. And then, you know, that single life runs out and you put out the next one because we all have the attention span of goldfish. Yeah. It's, what? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's shiny thing. Yeah. Uh, well, congrats for putting out an album because, like, it's that's even rare nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Just a complete one. Yeah. In the sense of like, I want you to listen to this as an album. Right. As a whole completed project. Mm -hmm. So kudos to that. Cause that's like, to me, that's like a real musician, artist, art, you know, like this is a full piece of this yeah. point in my life. Here's a project. Here's yeah, something. exactly. Here's yeah. where I, this is how I felt from this time to this time. <laughs> And you're capturing it all yeah. in a movie. I think it, like an album is the same as in like a comedian's new special or like a movie. It's like that same yeah. m a massiveness of a, of a project. It's so. a sphere I'd love to move into with syncing and stuff like that. Because when I write songs, I actually write them with like with scenes and pictures oh, and stuff in mind. Scores yeah, and stuff like or that. Write, even writing to spec or just um, it's so. I mean that's another whole thing on itself but usually my songs like if i'm i'm writing i'm picture trying to picture something as, as i'm writing it and so a lot of the times if you you know you, i'll be watching a movie and be like oh this song would fit good in that scene or yeah, yeah. Or, or session like that so um but that's just how i think i know there's a lot of other artists that are kind of all over the map that's what makes us fun that's what we, that's what we said at the beginning of this yeah. podcast that's the point it's like we're all multifaceted talented yeah. you know a B techs and <laughs> operators. Um, yeah, it's uh, myself too. It's evolving too, and I've had to evolve with the social media. And it's, I still don't think I've grasped the single world. I think I'm too far old that I can't shift over. Right. But I understand it, and now I understand it as like a marketing tool. And I kind of did that a little bit. Mm -hmm. It was only just like with a video and then a couple of pieces of content with it. Right. It's like, I'm still going to release my album as a whole, but I think, yeah, eventually, you know, it's going to be staggered. Yeah. With the way it's marketed. I mean, I think what the hard part, yeah, the hard part with albums is that everybody wants new stuff all the time, right? Exactly. And so it's rare that someone's actually just going to sit down and listen to an album because that's just how, you know, we have, all of us have the whole music library of the world in our pockets at all times, you know, for $14 a month. So, um, it's, it's tough to sell an actual record to be listened to front to back. Um, because a lot of new listeners just don't have that, you know, appreciation or they're finding their, their music on TikTok in 15 yeah. second or one minute videos. And so it's really just, yeah, it's just mar part of marketing, trying to successfully market something. You, you gotta, I guess, do, go and do what is fashionable at this time. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, that's why I kind of liked the idea of having the hard copies of a full album to sell at shows or sell independently and then you know for the dsps and all the streaming and all that kind of stuff i can put out the singles and play that game too yeah and kind of have you know the best of both worlds i uh i was just gonna ask you that that was my segue i was gonna ask you into that uh because well you're um, you're probably like more you're you're more in the internet age than you are less of because i my age is like half and half it's like Right. It's distinctive, like right at 20, there's like no internet after. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, it was all, all distribution. There was always some sort of phys physical piece, you know? Right. And then for some reason uh, in my second album, I just like saw the, the future before a few people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not going to make any physical copies. So my second and third album was just straight Streaming. online. I'm going to probably circle back now again. And yeah. I've never done vinyl and I think I would like it because yeah. I've heard my CD a few times and it's like, 
it's a different quality when you have a good mixed album yeah. on CD and wave file. It's way different quality. It's way fucking different. Yeah. It's not as compressed as you would get on all the streaming services. Yes, you get, you can get like high fidelity ones, like a title, mm -hmm. and there's certain services that have it, right. but you would have to have good speakers as well to yeah. match it. But it's like, yeah, a good CD transferred onto a, a vinyl yeah. is a good sound. 100%. <clears throat> and, uh, and vinyl, I mean, Vinyl's made a comeback, but I don't know if it's ever really even gone away. Um, people no, that's always still love point. vinyl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the vinyl listeners really, you know, I'm, I'm one of them. Uh, there's some days that like, yeah, all I want to listen to is a vinyl of a certain record. And yeah. it's not going to sound near as good if I just put it on the computer. So, you know, you got to have that vinyl. Um, and I, I, so going back to your point of the internet age and not internet age, I kind of had um, cell phones was a big one, pre cell yeah, phone, yeah. post cell phone. But internet wise, I lived in the country, so we didn't have. So it took you a while. So, like, that. I couldn't play World of Warcraft like my friends did because my fucking computer would die. You know, yeah. I, I remember the LimeWire and Napster, like all those things, because that was a big deal in my teens. Um, so we picked up the phone and you're fucked. Yeah, you're fucked, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, LimeWire giving your computer AIDS. Like, yeah, it's. Yeah. it's <laughs> All turn it off, things. turn it off. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah. don't download that. No, no. Um, and so it, so I still we still made hard copies. Like I, I fucking um, made all of our copies because you know we're fucking broke student. Yeah. Of our first Far From Keen record, the the Screamo band. Like I stood at my computer and fucking burned all the discs and like we had a little fucking cheap ass cover art we put That's in the thing yeah and yeah. uh and sold those at shows so we did that and we actually burnt we made discs for my old rock band too right some revelry um but then after that so that would have been 2012 after that uh i haven't put anything on hard copy yeah but i will but i'll be doing that again now that was my last yeah it's funny you said 2012 that was my last thing i printed yeah was uh, my first album mm -hmm. and I had worked with my friend for 10 years before that and everything that every project that him and I did we printed so we had one album two three that we printed CDs mm -hmm. for uh, four four actually we printed CDs for and then mine was like the fifth and then after that I was like I'm not CDs anymore. You can't get rid of these fucking things. Yeah. You just end up with a box. Oh, well, yeah. I, can't, I finally got rid of them when I started traveling. Like right. when I started yeah. going to Europe and like uh, Caribbean and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It's like, oh, people have CD players. <laughs> awesome. Here you go. Fucking have one. Just play it loud. Yeah, you're, just, you're just giving them away <laughs> yeah, now. Just play yeah. it loud. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It broke even with most of them. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because it's like. I remember the era of like, this is my early 20s, and this is like the 2000s, and then late 90s, was always going to H&B like every Tuesday, oh, yeah. all the new, all the new albums that came out, and just like, oh, here's a selection of new albums, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh. you got swayed a little bit by the mm -hmm. TV, because it was like, yeah. the single kind of like lured you to, to buy these albums, mm -hmm. some of them, yeah, and uh I was just thinking today, like, how many amazing fucking albums I missed in the mid-90s. Just yeah. because I was kind of focused on a lot of the popular albums, right? right? Yeah. And it's just like, I, the last two years I've been phasing through so many albums that were, like, in my stratosphere yeah. as a, a teen. But I kind of, like, absorbed it a little. Mm -hmm. And then, like, re-listened to them as an adult. And I was like, whoa, these are... <laughs> yeah, it's fun to go back to those albums. records, man. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I did have, I have the tail end of my, or I guess in my high school years were those H and B days. Like we, yeah. I, I loved going to the, like I had, you know, the books, the CDs in my car. Yeah. That was, I mean, really 2008, 2009 is when that kind of started because you could download music and stuff like yeah. that. But, um, yeah, man, that was my favorite thing in the world. I would just go by the fucking, the machine in the post that had all the like the sample records yeah and you could like put the headphones on and listen to them and see if you like something that's what i was talking yeah. about you go there and you can really suss out the whole album yeah if you had time to like i had exactly. time to yeah. or something and just like all right just blow through the whole album see yeah. if i like this just sports purchasing 
It was a different uh, time though. Like you can yeah. even just like see you like the cover of an album, the cover uh-huh. art. All right, I'll give this a shot. That'll and, sell it too. Yeah. Yeah, man. I yeah. I found a ton of records that way just by yeah. liking the name or liking the the cover art on it. Yeah. It's in the fucking bargain bin or something like that, or it's an indie band and it's just price lower. Yeah. Well, also too, you have art. There's like because that's the funny thing you mentioned that too because. My the last album I printed was the last time I did the the spine for the yep. layout for the back for the actual image you put on the CD mm-hmm. the sleeve like the booklet like you think of a theme of like you're yep. taking photos and like oh what am I gonna put in all these pages the only thing I thought of for the f- second and third album was just the cover yeah so there's no like that's a, that's another part art artistic part of your album too is like that's that also tells the story and that's I think. You know, I think that's probably why we're like in a mode of hearing singles because it's like that's why people have detached themselves from albums because there's no, uh, you're not absorbed in that world anymore. Because no. when you would buy the album, you would take it home, throw the cans on, read. I would read the credits the and like, notes, yeah. yo, this person fucking Fuck yeah. produced yeah. it. This person wrote it. And so, like, that was intriguing, and you were, like, really listening to it and, and involved in it, and you had, took your time with it, right? A lot of that's where the lyrics were, too, right? So, yeah. like, I love, I mean, I love looking at and reading lyrics and, yeah. and that stuff. Um, I mean, yeah, because it all, there was no internet. <laughs> there, was, yeah. there was no lyrics.com or something yeah. like that, so... It was either guessing and saying the wrong thing or uh, trying to figure out what, what they were actually saying. Well, I've seen the whole era. Like, I, when I was in... When I was in school... <laughs> Back I, in my day. Yeah, yeah, this is... I am like that already, dude. I'm there. <laughs> I am there. I am that guy. Turn that fucking shit down. I am that guy. I'm there. Uh, we were the first digital class ever right. we were the last analog and first digital we were the crossover so we were the first to use like auto audio digital programs mm-hmm. and like audio uh, like digital editing programs so we had a, a radio lab project each week and me and my buddy this guy we hooked up he's like into hip-hop so we finished our project within the hour and we had the whole week to mm-hmm to uh, finish this project. So every night we would sign out all the radio labs. And then, this is how old I am, they had carts, eight tracks. Mm-hmm. So when you put that in, and that was hooked in through the computer. Right. So we would put in a CD in the computer and we get the last little loop of like a masterpiece song or like a No right. Limit song. And like, just a little instrumental. So we'd capture it on the cart, manage to get a eight bar loop throw it back on the program yeah loop it out there and then put it back on the cart as full like a 90 second cart so that would be a, a verse and a hook right basically 90 seconds yeah so then we throw it back on the program and then you triple it so you have a track so you had the, yeah. yeah like five minutes it always right. worked out to like that and then we had the old pods for like turning mm-hmm. up the volumes and then that arm that comes in like the dj arm yeah. with the mic so we would lay the the instrumental on the program acid was the program and he would drop the, the lyrics on it so we made our albums and then our friend of ours had uh he was taking print class <laughs> or uh he was in graphics so he had access to all the printers in the school so after we would made all our songs we would burn it on cd and then we would go to the print room and then print our uh, booklets, right. yeah. our, our uh, you know stickers that went on the album, and then we would go to all the bars and like get them to play music. And yeah, I was like, this is fun. That's awesome. I, I like to do this. This is interesting. <laughs> this is this is interesting. This is a Indie cool music experience. Is, is interesting. But what I was saying is like, the beginning was really hard. Like it's like he it came out of an era where it was like making a lot of money. And then it just crashed, like with Napster. Yeah. Like that was my first year of college, and my my roommate had Napster, and it was just like we took hold of that technology right away and used it for for making music. Yeah. So, um, it's interesting nowadays. It's like live streaming and stuff like that. I feel like 
it's done a full circle where it's going to really help the independent artists, like the technology. Yeah. <coughs> and also more of an independent balance, you know? Well, we've kind of reached this fun point now. I feel like, you know, there was when Napster and everything happened, it fucking threw everything up in the air. And then we had this like 10 years up until 2015 with, you know, Spotify and that stuff coming out where it was like, it was a ghost, you know, fucking, no one knew what to do. Ringtones. It was, yeah, yeah, ringtones. Ringtones are making money. There was like this fucking MP3 player yeah. was, and that turned to the iPod, but there was also like mini disc players. Yeah, everything came everything, out. Everything came out. People were just throwing shit at the wall. Yeah, it was, exactly. I remember like seeing my friends with um, iPods and being like, what the fuck is that thing? Like, yeah. No, I got my disc bin with anti skip technology. Like, it like this. I'm going to keep this forever. <laughs> That seems ridiculous. Getting my computer to put music on my on on this device, yeah, um, and uh, the fucking iPod Shuffle, all those like, yeah, just it well, was that's a weird. Where the time. music uh, started quality just changed because yeah. it was all about room. Yeah, because when you storage. first got the first one, it was so much for a little amount of storage. Yeah, yeah, here you can fit twenty songs on this thing, so it's better than a CD, but you only have twenty songs. Yeah, <laughs> so, like, it, it's. Yeah, it was kind of this weird space and everybody was kind of trying to figure shit out and then this whole streaming worlds came come and taking a lot of money out of people's pockets um, yeah. and giving it to, you know, a couple of corporations but it's now like this is kind of the game you have to play and those are basically just marketing tools and, you know but it's one of the best times in the world to be an artist because I mean, going back to to scoring and and sync and stuff like that there are so many you know like little tv little companies and so much being made that way that need music and want independent music that doesn't cost a lot to make so you can really you know do well in that atmosphere um and then also as an independent artist like you hold your fate in your hands um if you blow up on tiktok or you blow up on instagram or one of those places well guess what now you get to dictate your 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 terms on your record deal basically yeah and um you know i guess if you're ready for that that's up to you as a person but or as an artist but uh it gives us a lot more on our side of like once you do hit those levels you have a lot more leverage in yeah. the field because labels really aren't doing um any development deals anymore no. um there's a lot more independent labels coming out and or just management companies and that stuff and, and um, booking agents who are really starting to take on more of that role of the labels um, because, yeah, there's no reason for them to have development divisions or anything like that anymore when they can just go on TikTok and see someone blow up with a, a million, a couple million views and sign them to a record deal. See somebody that's developed already. What's that, sorry? See somebody that's, yeah, developed, that's already already. developed already. Yeah. That's, the, that's the name of the game now, too. And uh, it's funny you said that. It's like everything's at the fingertips now if you want to. Like, it's just you can go days and days and days and finding ways of like making money off it. But it's like you also need to learn a lot. Like, there's so much to learn mm -hmm. in the aspects of owning your music and like, you know, your right codes and all that stuff. Yeah. And, I uh, went down a rabbit hole of, like publishing through the lockdown and just mm -hmm. obviously scratching the, sur the surface of so much shit. Um, I just find out, out through trial and error with my own stuff too. Um, have you ever heard of anything called the black box? It's like a digital I concept. So. I know, I don't think so. So you know if you don't like, you don't uh, get your registration code like your IRC or your UPC or, your or, UPC yep. or like anything like that. So it's just, if it's just like, you make a, a track, you don't make any codes, you just throw it out there in the ether and, uh, and nobody claims it for like two, three years. Sorry. Bless you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> That's what it is. It's like, yeah. it's so thievery that I had a, a reaction to it. So what it is, it's it's like 
a digital entity. So if nobody has, like, if you if your song goes mm -hmm. berserk, right? You know, right. it's like a TikTok thing goes nuts, and nobody's claimed it. It goes into this entity called the black box. It, yeah. it accumulates like two million dollars or whatever. So if nobody claims it in like three years, it goes to the top five earners. Oh really? Of the record labels. Weird. So okay. like, yeah. I don't know, artists like Drake and Adele and all these, mm -hmm. they get, they get this kickback from all this oh, un crazy. Like unchecked money. Unchecked money. So when you, if you do your, uh, like if you're missing stuff like that and mm -hmm. you, uh, register songs with codes mm -hmm. that are already out, I'm per I think a lot of things retroactive, like three years or something, they can go back two, three years and collect for you so i know so can so our canadian organization um we'll go back to i think it'll it'll collect them as long as you've registered them that's yeah. the biggest thing um but if you don't have yeah if you just put it out there without a distribu distributor with no upc or isrc then yeah you're it's fucked just it's just floating in the ether um yeah, so who taught you that? Did you learn that shit, or did you like? Did somebody point you in the right direction with that? I, or I like... mean, I learned that kind of over time. Um, so, but there's okay. Here's our fucking publishing lesson for the day. <laughs> here, um, here, here come. So, SoCan is sorry. Yeah, SoCan's one set of rights. Soon to be brought to you by SoCan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go back. SoCan's one set of rights. Then you have SoCan RR, which is another set of rights. And then if you have anything in the States or Sirius XM, you have Sound Exchange. That's another set of rights. That's the big daddy. Yeah, that's the big... Oh, that's that's my my best friend. The mega daddy. Yeah. And, um, and then you have Trust. Actor Rack, Song Trust. Um, I mean, in the States, BMI and ASCAP. Uh, which is basically which is so can but only big daddy um and so you have your neighboring rights and mechanical rights and publishing rights. Like you have there are so many streams and unfortunately as an artist you need to be dialed into each one of them and also be up to date so um you know i have all my songs registered with sound exchange and so can and so can rr because that keeps it all in one nice little box um and so in perpetuity basically as long as my songs are doing things because I've registered them with the codes, I will make kickbacks off of whatever they're earning. And that's, yeah. It's a lesson, kids. That's the, mm. you heard it from the pro. Yeah. yeah. Right <laughs> Professional right here. Register your stuff exactly. with your with your local, or not local, or Canadian, your, your, your international. Canadian jurisdiction, or your, your country's jurisdiction. Country's jurisdiction, that's it. Make sure you're getting paid because you you might as well. <laughs> you might as well. Yeah. That's the fucking motto of the day. Uh, my uh, engineer taught me that from day one. Mm -hmm. And he was like, just do this because he's like, you never know. And yeah. I'm glad he taught me. Uh, I still need to learn a lot. There's still much, so much more to learn about it. But yeah, it's get your shit together. Get your codes. Get mm -hmm. your uh, registration. Get it all. SoCan is one of the big ones. You mm -hmm. want to get, you want to start with SoCan, get your SoCan, and then, then you're on your way. Yeah, and and I mean, if you're on Sirius XM, I mean that's kind of the big one, or, or internet radio in the U.S. Sound Exchange is. That's the big daddy. Is, that's is the, the big one. Washington. That's the. Yeah, and uh, and especially if you're on Sirius XM, like that's the, I get paid a good amount of money to being on there, and yeah. so. Um, if you, if you know you're going to make money, you know, so can I still get, you know, a quarterly check that's not, I wouldn't drop, I wouldn't leave it on the street if it, if it was sitting yeah, there. Yeah, so. it's where the American, like you yeah. said, the Amer it's about all the American consumption. It's how, yeah. how much more American years can you get on your music? Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, especially my music, I, yeah. I've had success in the, in the States because of my music, because yeah. of how my music sounds. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's. I've been very fortunate with with the uh, with being able to collect and make you know a good revenue stream through music. Good for you, man. I hope mm -hmm. all the best for you and you keep on climbing. Keep Thanks, getting, brother. Yeah. Crushing it and fucking keep moving forward. Stadiums and fucking rodeos. And we'll shit. get there. We'll get there. Yeah, man. Yeah. 
Well, well, thank you for doing this. Of I course, appreciate man. it, man. Appreciate you having me. I appreciate yeah. you letting me crash at your house for yeah, a number of man. weeks and <laughs> been a great guest. <laughs> Help so, me out. Yeah, no yeah. worries. And uh, you know, it's gonna get bigger and brighter. We got some amazing indie artists in this country. It's just phenomenal. We do. We Always do. have. 100%. Yeah. It's just like now we can present it on so many different mediums. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. great. It's great. Big, big. It's gonna be. Uh, yeah, we're, we're Canada's on the app. We got lots of lots of great artists. Yeah, man. Yeah. All right. Thanks, awesome. Man. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good night, folks.